Welcome to Talking in Stations. Uh, this is Madderall uh, here with Arcia. Hello. And Abby Rova. How are you doing, Abby? I'm good. How's everybody? Good. Let me actually turn on some bubbles here. There. So you can see who's talking and when. All right. It is May. I want to say 19th, and that sounds right. So May 19th. And EVE Online, we're going to go over some of the news, some of the headlines, and uh, talk also about planetary interaction that is known as PI or PI sometimes. And that is talking essentially about mining planets and getting some uh, materials off those planets. It's um, been around for a little while now. I want to say it came in with Tyrannus uh, expansion, and that would be about 2000, I want to say 13. Yeah, but uh, it's gotten updated a few times that gameplay did and its products have been used in more and more things uh, mostly structures and uh, and now will be used actually in more and more um, ships and probably modules in the future so we'll look into that some had always been used that way but we'll talk about that a little bit later when abby tells us about planetary interaction but first let's go to some news and some headlines Right, Arcia, we'll uh, ask you first, what's going on with Electus Matari, your group that you belong to? Oh, us, among other groups, are involved in a war in the region of Hachvan. Uh, last night, there was a pretty large battle in Wirishota. It's, it's large to me. It was like, we had like 130, 240 people on our side, and the other side had about 200 people. Um, it was, it started, it started with a deck, uh, a war deck in high sec, right? Uh, Electus Matari war decked a group in a bud bond in, in Min Matari space called Malicious Mineral Hounds, who are pirates who attack the other miners in a bud bond. Electus Matari is a role playing group that is loyal to the Min Matari Republic. So we are, we pick our targets based on like pirates or, or uh, Amar groups or Triglavian groups, and local pirates are pretty high on our short list of people to kind of go after for the role play reasons. After the war was declared, um, a diplomatic deal was, was reached between the two groups where they were supposed to stop pirating in Republic space. Specifically, we didn't care if they did it somewhere else. Um, and there'd be no war. So that was reached, but some of their members kept, kept like ganking miners and stuff. So we tried to put pressure like, hey, you, to uphold the deal, you have to actually uphold the deal. And then their allies in Pachven, Streetball, Clade, hit our, our Astra house in Skarkon. Um, and we said, okay, we'll fight over here. And we formed to defend the armor timer. And dock workers also came. Uh, well, dock workers alone, I think, reinforced the armor timer. Uh, we didn't have enough in the initial form for the armor timer to beat them, so we extracted after after a few losses and seeing that we couldn't couldn't break their reps. Um, and then got some more friends, came back for the hull timer. Uh, hull timer fight was about sixty to seventy on our side and ninety on ninety or so on the other side of Streetbog Clade and Dock Workers, and it was a super fun fight. It was like an hour and a half long. Um, where we kept trying to grab the the two fleets that were split up, the Streetbog and the Dock Workers. We kept trying to grab them, whereas they kept trying to get away from our Typhoon fleets. The Dock Workers had Zealots, Streetbog Clay had Drekovax, and we had Typhoons. Um, we were we did a bad job at trying to hold them down. So while well, well, we we definitely got some kills during that fight, they were able to keep damage on the Citadel. And the Citadel eventually destroyed, was destroyed uh, after a, a long, super fun fight. Um, after that, our other Citadel in Pachvin was reinforced in the other side of Pachvin in Angry Moni. And we formed with some more people for the armor timer. Um, and that one we held. Uh, we we did really well on that one. We we learned how to bubble. The low seckers learned how to bubble <laughs> <laughs> and hold down the enemy fleet. Um, and 
we counterattacked and hit some struct two structures in Wirishoda. Uh and then we were we were hit back again by the Bastion after we were contacted saying uh, we care about this Tatara that you hit um by a diplomat guy. Uh and I expected yesterday to be bigger than it was, but it was it was like 140 to, to 200 or so, I think, on the battle report. And it was our side, We uh, the role-playing group and our friends had the various role-playing groups. There was like three or four different RP alliances and some of our various blues as well as, uh, I think, Rote Capel and Nilsechnia Shilpen were on our side of the, the fight and the... The, the biggest group on their side um, in the engagement was Streebog Clay. They had a really, really, really good form. I was super impressed by it. They had like 64 people from Streebog Clay on the battle report, and then plus whatever support that didn't make it on the battle report. Um, and there was other gr- some other Triglavian groups. Um, Goon Swarm had about like 20-something people. Uh, and there was just, I think Bomber's Bar showed up on that side, but it was mainly... Typhoons from the role players, Cerberuses from uh, Rote, uh, Nosek Nishal Pen, and uh, Protean Concept versus Baltech Megathrons on the Streebog side, Streebog and Friends. And we had a bloody battle on the in gate that was super fun. Like the gate had like 130 bubbles around it. There was no tie dye. There was no tie dye. I don't think it got big enough to make tie dye without crime watch. Cause in low sec, maybe it would have, but with, with no crime ro- with crime watch, cause that slows it down, but no tie dye last night. Um, anyway, after the battle on the in gate, we got out of the bubbles, we disengaged and we, we were trying to get everybody to, come back together and then try to attack the Tatara. There was only a couple minutes left on the Tatara reinforcement. The Astor House repaired, like during the fighting on the gates. There was a couple minutes left on the Tatara reinforcement. And we went in maybe a little ill-advisedly um, before ev- everybody who was on our side regrouped. Um, so like the role players went in with the Typhoons. And from what the Sriba guys said, they got some of the pings I was making earlier in the day. So like, that's like really, really good on them. So they, they had had caught some of the pings when they were being made that, uh, by me actually on their Citadel grid and the Baltics landed on the Typhoons and we lost, we lost a fair amount in that exchange. And then we extracted overall, we lost like 18 billion. They lost their side loss, like 20 something, 26 or 7 billion. And both of their their citadels were repaired, and our citadel was repaired back two jumps away. Um, and every it was it was a really fun fight, one of the top five I've ever been in. Like everybody mm. had a blast last night. Yeah, Ormia says he lost his EOS. Uh, that's a command ship early on. Mm. The EOS now looks like the Myrmidon, doesn't it? it? Used to look like the Brudix. Am I wrong about that? The Eos looks like the Myrmidon. Yeah. It does now. Yeah. It used yeah, to look yeah. like a Brudix. Um, oh, oh, are they talking about the Eos in um, Angry Money that was separated from the fleet? We undocked and there was just like a freight Eos sitting in front of us. That was, that was, that was kind of funny. Yeah. Oh, yeah. On the, on the gate was, um, the gate fighting was super fun. We did, we did really well on the gate. We only lost a few things. I mean, we lost we lost a few things, but our fleet was really big. Yeah. On on we kind of came in, we kind of yellowed at the Tatara just because we'd be disappointed if we didn't try. And they had they 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 outplayed us and got one of our bookmarks and landed on us and it, and we t- we took our licks too. So we ended up taking our licks too. So everybody took their licks yeah. uh, last night. I'm looking right? at the the battle report and it's a little better than you had said earlier. Or it's you know I it s- takes time. It's up to it's. No, it should be populated. Um, it is it's now. Like, it's like we lost like eighteen something, and they lost like twenty seven something, right? You lost seventeen and a half billion. They lost like twenty eight point eight billion. Which is, yeah, it's not that big a deal, right? Yeah. 
No, uh, just a little bit. You, you did a little better than you said you did. Uh, so good job. I mean, we lost the tactical objectives, right? Oh, well, that's not so great. Then. I mean, I mean, I think everybody won the fun objectives. That yeah. was fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By the way, I love how chat uh, makes sure that we're honest, which is great. The Aos looks like the Myrmidon, and the Astarte looks like the Brutex. Oh, yeah, um, and THX in uh, chat is right. Most of our losses were on the Tatara. Uh, because they were able to land right on us. Um, but mm -hmm. nobody really regrets it. Like, we would have regretted it more if we didn't try for the Tatara, because the Tatara is like a special Tatara, because you can't replace it. And right. we're so going there. after... Basically, this all came out of, like, Streebog and EM, and the other groups within uh, that were fighting with EM were fighting a lot during the invasions. Uh, and we... Tar we target them out of RP. Well, they, they actually hit us first, but they are one of our heated RP enemies, and we love them out of character. Um, there's a bunch of Streetbot guys on like the roleplay Discord, and all of us are, are pretty friendly, but more people are piling in on both sides in, in the fight. It's probably going to keep escalating, and I think it's super fun. I love that. We love them out of the character. Why would why would we not right? Like, do you do you hate people who are playing volleyball against you? Right? <laughs> they have the triangle jerseys and we have the rusty jerseys. It's fine. Yeah. One last thing about that, I I just want to see if this is. Uh, I think it was Nick that said the EOS always look like a Myrmidon. I don't think that's true. I think uh, the command ships both looked like the Brudix until recently. They used to look like the Brutics, and the the Absolution also used to look like the prop. Like they all used to look like the same battle cruiser, and then they they changed them to look like the two different battle cruisers. Yeah, like the the Absolution used to be a a, a red and gold chicken, and now it's a red and gold tar baby. Right. <laughs> What's the chicken's actual ship name? Prophecy. Uh, prophecy. Yeah, and so did the Damnation. It looked like the prophecy. Damnation looks like a chicken now. It, it it's still a burnt looks chicken. like it. Yeah. it. It's the burnt turkey, and the uh, and the Prophecy is the battle chicken. I always wanted to fly a damnation as like my official ship for a long time because that's the first ship that's described in the Imperium Age, the book uh, for Eve Online. You know what was super interesting about last night? Mm. We used the signature radius suppressors for the first time, and they seemed to be really effective when the bombers bar uh, did the bomb runs against us. Are those? We the how yeah. new are those? They replace the. Um, Target Spectrum Breaker, not that long ago, right? a couple months, maybe. Oh, wow. So your signature gets small, which means that on computer, or as far as the bombs are concerned, you're... So they're uh, like bombing a cruiser instead of bombing a battleship or yeah, something. You're tinier or smaller. Huh. And we explained yesterday that if you're bombing, you want a bigger target because the splash damage of the bomb uh, just is bigger. So, yeah, whenever the bombers... Uh, did their bomb run? We'd hit the, we'd all hit our signature radius suppressors, and it worked well. We, I don't think we lost anything to bombs. Oh wow! We we lost almost all the ships we lost in the Tatara when they landed on us. Now, when you say you lost it uh, at the structure, the Tatara, the uh, mining facility there, did you lose? Um, did you lose it to any of its defense? If it even has, it defense, was the defense or? fleet. It was the no, it was the defense fleet. Defense the fleet. fleet landed okay. On. Yeah, it was, it was the Baltic Megatrons landed on us. Like a lot of them. Did you have any uh, defender missiles for the uh, missile counterplay? I, I don't think we have the the Dictor alts and stuff. Uh, we had like a pawn effects in fleet, and maybe we had an, a, a saber or a heretic. Um, or, or, or something. So like, to, to destroy it's everything. it's possible we could have we could have gotten a few more Dictors or a few more. Command SEs or something that can use defender missiles, but uh, like, also, that's didn't... why I'm asking. Yeah. Like, did you, you know, strip any of the bombs, which then would, of course, would even stack positively with the uh, the sig radius? No, we, we we didn't. We didn't. We just we just hit the suppressors and ate it, ate the bombs to the face, and it was fine. Bombs to the face. Nothing wrong with that. I mean, it wasn't like an outrageous amount of bombers. It wasn't like. But they definitely helped. There you go, Nick. I'm showing the uh, Aos in the form of a Brutix 
later it gets changed to Myrmidon. I'm sorry, I keep going on and on about that, but I just wanted to make sure it wasn't crazy. <laughs> Guys, the well, EOS hey, Nick, you're looks just like wrong a Myrmidon. Just stuff it in your face. <laughs> Forget about the biggest fight in Potchman. The EOS looks like a Myrmidon, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Can you're I right. pile on the Nick, you're wrong train, please? No, no. Um, <laughs> Nick's actually super reliable, which is why I doubt myself and say, wait, I better look this up. But you're right. I mean, the big story here is not the shape of the ship, but the uh, battle. No, the big story into... is definitely that the Eros looks like a Myrmidon. <laughs> I, I think. I think that's. Did you know that the Absolution looks like a Harbinger? Yes, yeah. I do know that now. Which is your favorite ship, isn't it? The Harbaby. Yes, Harbaby Har is best baby. Yeah. But last night, my my glorious Typhoon fleet died in the Astro in the uh, Tatara, on the Tatara after after living for so many fights. Uh, it served me well. I think Mexico. I think that I think that Typhoon Fleet survived a lot of a lot of really spicy fights. So I got I got my LPs worth. We were suggesting to CCP that uh, kill marks should be on kill mails. That's not a thing yet, is it? What do you mean? Like a ship's kill marks should be on the kill mail. Once it dies, it should be. Oh, how, how many kill yeah. marks the ship had? Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, it'd be kind of cool, right? It's like it's just it's the kill mail. I, I would I would worry more about getting a lodgy on the kill mails, right? That's gonna happen too. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. But <laughs> right. but the the so it hasn't happened yet. But we're we're uh, making a lot of suggestions to them about kill mails and stuff and how they should. We were talking a lot about I mean, kill mails. But lodgy and like boosters, like I want accurate reports. <laughs> That's basically it. Yeah. The the idea of a kill mail is a proof positive that you killed somebody. It's kind of like a little receipt, but it also memorializes a ship. Like a ship, if you repackage it, loses its identity. That's why rigs fall off and I think kill kill marks fall off. It loses its identity. It's converted back to a generic. And then when it's unpackaged, it's a whole nother ship. It's not what it was before. So the only way to really memorialize a ship is to de get it destroyed. Because the kill mail then is evidence it's frozen in time forever and uh that's that's one of the functions of a kill mail which is kind of interesting okay i wanted to ask you a question though arcia about role playing yeah what was it that we talked about earlier oh you learned a lot about null sec and how they see things as and as opposed to role well, players not necessarily not necessarily exclusively null sec but like non-role players versus like because like the things there's been a lot of like talking about the fight in various places and a lot of people just don't understand and like everybody does fights who they fight or does what they doesn't does what they do in the game because they have objectives and some people the objective is centered around building an empire or making making more isk or just just having a fun time right but role players are often centered about around things like having a good story or uh like developing your character or all I mean, a lot of times it's also about having fun, right? Like, I think that's like the super constant. Everybody wants to have fun. Um, but like a lot of people be like, why are you attacking uh, attacking something that can never be replaced if it's destroyed? And it's, let, let's forget for a second that our Citadel was hit first. Let's just imagine that it's a parallel universe where we hit them first um, because they were completely justified to shoot us because we are their enemies not not in real life but in the game um let, let's assume we hit we're going after the tatara out of nowhere uh or the astro house out of nowhere like to our characters these people basically abducted millions and millions of people in these systems that are now controlled by the triglavian uh collective they forced them to be bioadapted we don't know like the super specifics about um everything that happened we know like vague bits of pieces of stuff that have been in the news the triglavians aren't really super understood yet but uh 
like to our, to our characters, like the, these are the baddies and maybe it comes out in the end that we're the baddies, but we'd still think we're the goodies. If that makes sense. <laughs> Basically like it makes sense, but there's a like, lot of that going on. Some people pick their, their enemies based on this group is fun to attack or this group is lucrative esquires to attack or this group is really big and dangerous to me so we have to we have to team up against them now which is kind of like how i understand the current null war like the the other alliances are teaming up on imperium because they were super super strong that's maybe i'm maybe i'm wrong in that understanding but our our motivations are not like we don't we don't have beef with imperium or poppy because they're just kind of these weird mercenary groups that live out in the outer regions and they're kind of they're kind of strange but they're not so as they're, bad they're, they're not wealth as bad and, as like yeah their wealth and power means nothing to you because like they're external they're just kind of, like they don't they're not trying to like co-hurt the minmatar republic except when they do right but uh and com like compared to the empires any independent capsular group which is what we are is just tiny so like even you take Goonswarm or Imperium and Poppy, you put them together on the same side. And like the smallest of the empires doesn't really care about that. Like it's, it's the empires have lore wise, like absurd amounts of power that we can't even comprehend. But um, independent capsulaires are definitely like something that can upset the balance of power, but not outright defeat an empire, for example. So what do you but, care about? That's, you're saying so that players have reasons to hate each we other. We care about fight. somebody who is a Triglavian supporter because the Triglavians are one of the people who hurt the Minotaur. Or like sometimes we fight the Amar supporters. Sometimes we fight local pirates who are uh, like killing people or doing doing evil crime in our area. Um, things like that. Uh, Triglavian supporters are if you make a triglavian role play group you generally just get set red for ma making a triglavian and that's not because we hate you that's because if you make a triglavian role play group it's it's kind of assumed that so, isn't it kind of assumed that the anti-triglavian groups are gonna yeah. go grr so you have <laughs> built-in motivations and so when you go into a fight with these people you have built-in motivations Win or lose, you're looking for a good story. Is that what our peers focus on? We, or? I mean, ultimately, yeah. I mean, I can't speak for everybody. We're, we're everybody's ultimately focusing on having fun, and we will totally pick fights that we expect to lose if it sounds fun, and a lot of times it does. You mean it ends up being fun? Hell yeah. <laughs> so then, uh, so that takes a lot of pressure off like winning a fight because you just want an interesting. No. So you still want to win. You, we, 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 we never throw a fight. We always try our utmost to win. We do out, we do the same kind of planning in advance. We do the same kind of preparations um, that none our fears do. We're just but, not. Yeah, I look at it as more as a safety net. I used to do a bunch of RP in another game and total competitive people. I mean, ultimately on the non-RP side, you're still the same game players. You're still playing all the, the same game and you have the same drives and wants to finish. But you have an additional safety net that if you lose the objective or you lose the fight, you still get to advance your story. You still get to advance your role play activity. You now have many other avenues to then take off. And tomorrow I can like, wow, I'm licking my loon, wounds and I'm doing this and I'm doing that. You just, you always win ultimately because role play is so um, engrossing and encapsulating in that, that you can go anywhere with it. And that's the way I always took role playing to be is that it's, it's trapeze with a net. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a gameplay style with a net. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with a net. It's just another safety mechanism. So you actually never lose. That's the way I liked it. That's what I always liked about it. Um, I mean, you can definitely say you lost, but that's just, that just, like you said, it does just become part of the story. I lost. What do, what do I do from here? I'm, I'm a capsuleer, so I'm not dead. Right. What do I do from here to not lose the next right. time? 
So you as the person don't lose. The player, the role player. I mean, I still lost lose. if I lose. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, 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 I'm maybe not I like. Took, maybe it's just me how I took it. But I'm not upset about it. I mean, I, even if I am upset about it, I'm not like mad at the other person for, um, for scoring against me in volleyball. <laughs> I'm role playing right? upset. <laughs> oh, yeah. We totally do that. Go to the in character channels. My, my character is a loud mouth. I mean, I'm probably a loud mouth too, but I'm a friendly <laughs> loud mouth. And she is actually kind of, kind of grr. All right. I mean, you keep bringing up the volleyball thing. I used to play hockey and rugby. Let me know. Let me tell you, I actually hated many of the other guys I played against. I, I played volleyball in high school, so that's yeah. kind of why I go back to that. Yeah, there may be a different level of aggression, right? You can't run under the net and body check someone if they piss you off. But <laughs> You could, but... I mean, you guess you could, but you, that's the last volleyball game you'll play for a long time. Oh, interesting. Well, and, and so what did you learn, though, about the difference between null sec and uh and well, low sec not, in our peers or well i kind of understand like i understand a lot of the low sec people because even even the non our peers because i was around them for a long time and i th think i understand maybe not all but a lot of like sm like uh, the other small gangers and like people who live in wormholes and kind of people who live in high sec but people in really big null blocks um, and this is nothing they did wrong, but a lot, it's, I've never been in a really big null block. So sometimes I don't understand them because I look at like today I've been to Reddit more times than I've been to Reddit in the last like two years because I keep getting linked threads uh, that pertain to last night's battle. And I normally avoid Reddit because there's a lot of posts from people in, in alliances, just like big big alliances just like trashing on each other and i find a lot of the people in big alliances are actually really nice if you talk to them like in all of them in goon swarm in test in pandemic horde um and like they're they're good <laughs> they're general there's always going to be jerk bags especially when a group's big some percentage of people are going to be jerks but m most people are, are like nice as long as you're nice to them and i see all these people who are probably nice people being so mean to each other and it upsets me that's not natural it isn't the natural state either like people say you're in natural competition but uh i think they've proven that humans aren't actually in natural competition with one another they're actually the successful evolved humans that we are are actually in cooperation with one another that's the natural state of a human is to actually seek cooperation. But you didn't I mean, that. I mean, I'm, I'm happy attacking people in the game, and I'm happy. I'm usually happy when people attack. Well, me. you are not natural, Arcia. You are a supernatural. That's rude. That's kind of rude. <laughs> you are I don't, not I don't attack realm. people in real life. Right? Did you just no, but, no but that's a difference attacking people in the game is fine and attacking people in real life is not fine well because attacking people in the game is actually cooperating with them especially in an rp form you are cooperating in this gameplay I mean, not i mean we're cooperating in the extent that we enjoy the fights that happen but like they don't want to lose i don't want to lose generally i'm i'm okay if I, if I do i do but i try to win and they try to win and they'd rather win and I'd rather win. But if I lose, it's not something to be angry about, about at them. I should be angry about it at me. Or your ship. Right? Yeah. Am I wrong? Uh, you tell me. You, you fight a heck of a lot more than I do. Uh, I'm in competition with players all the time, but I'm competing with them through market play and uh, that sort of stuff. But anyway, thanks very much, Arcia, for talking about uh, what happened with Electus Matari in Poshvin. There's a lot going on there, right? Since they made the change recently to allow more people into Poshvin without the standings problems to be able to travel in there, how has it been? Well, this couldn't have happened without the gates being unlocked. And um, I'm a little smug about it because when it came out, I was like, locking the gates is a dumb idea. The region is going to be dead. And then the region was dead. And then they unlocked it. And all of a sudden, we're fighting. So we'll see if it stay, keeps up. But you're thinking this may grow, right? I mean, I expect it to. People yeah. have seen these fights. When fights are seen, people tend to jump in them.
Yeah, yeah. Well, I've heard from a con who said it looks like this is kind of starting to grow into a bigger situation. I, I don't know if you had any thoughts on that. I mean, define what you like. It's it's bigger Maybe in more the extent of that it's it's all like all the non RP groups that are piling in um, on one side or another. They don't have the same motivations that like the the four RP alliances on our side or or the RP alliance on their side might have. Um, and maybe they are participating in the fight for different reasons, whether it's just they want they want the fights or they have some other kind of beef with one group or another. But like I think it is it's not all role play now because there are in those 200 people maybe like 70 are from role play groups right mm -hmm. so everybody has different motivations for being there and even if like we all went to bed and stopped fighting if, like all the role players went away the, the fighting's going to happen at this point no matter what i think right all right uh I was going to I was going to play with that, but I decided not to. But it, we'll see if it grows into. Uh, you know, more consistent gameplay inside of Poshman, I think it would be very interesting. If uh, if that place becomes uh, you said you saw some, I mean, Goonsworm was involved in this one. Are they are they growing their presence there? Does it seem like they're I mean, I think they have, like it, I saw like 20 something on the battle report from Goonsworm. There's maybe some support ships that didn't make the battle report um and like five from bastion so yeah it, i think it's like a sig i don't think it's like right. anything that's out in force <laughs> like i think it's a special interest group about potchman that maybe hangs out with street bog i don't think it's like something they do in force i think their chief diplomat is anuria at least he says he is so but it'd, like it'd be interesting to see how that goes <laughs> People like people who aren't used to RPers don't they underestimate a how many people in Eva RPers the RP community is pretty big, mm -hmm. and two they under they underestimate how good RPers are at the game, and I love that they that also image. underestimate the kinds of wars RP can start. Yeah. No matter what this escalates to, it started with RP. Yeah, it's a rich history with EVE Online and people uh, playing this science fiction world in character and uh, being being true to how that works. And it, and it has a whole way of working, which is very interesting. All right, um, Rundle, did you say that uh, there have been some uh, updates? Yeah, there's patch notes for today. Let me link that for you and I can start talking about it. Yeah, hand that over to me and we'll have a look. Yeah, it's a little hidden. I mean, when you click on the patch note, it, it kind of just takes it to the the 19.04. And if you don't scroll, you don't realize there was some patches for today. And I can cover that. All right. It's usually just fixes after a patch. But yeah, yeah, I mean, it's still, yeah, yeah. But, but it looks like after yesterday, yeah. after yesterday, there were some significant things to fix. All right. So, um, uh, Victoro uh, Luxury Yacht Owners, uh, you can celebrate now. You now have a, an additional high slot, so you can use the Interdiction Spear or uh, the Interdiction Nullifier mod. Um, With they the cloak. Mm -hmm. Well, the reason they put a second one in there is because this cloaks like yep. a Covert Ops, and you couldn't use its main power if you were going to nullify yourself. So essentially, right. they had taken away a power from it and not allowed you to use the power, uh, the, the two powers that it had uh, at the same time. So they had to fix that by adding a high slot. Yep. Yeah. It wasn't exactly fair to the choice uh, mentality, right? You're really choosing one or the other over it when the, the ship was just really kind of meant in this, this luxury yacht idea was meant to be able to do both of those things. So, right. Right. Um, and so, uh, some of the defect fixes, the modules, um, the ability for the stealth bombers to, to fit the restrained interdiction nullifier module, that was, uh, that's been removed. 
And then the activation duration attribute for introduction nullifier now shows as green when it is positively modified by bonus. So that way you can get a visual indication that you have some sort of bonus uh, impacting your interdiction nullifier. Uh, we talked about this yesterday, I think, where the trait to the shuttles for interdiction nullification, that's now in the, in the info. It will be listed that shuttles now do have the interdiction nullification. Um, and then for those people who were getting the uh, error dialogue, um, error message when they were trying to undock with a ship with too many modules of the same group, for example, the warp core or stabs, they fixed the error dialogue now so it correct, it tells you the correct, uh, correct error and uh, directs you to how to fix it. And those were, some of those were the main items that uh, I think most talk shows in EVE yesterday and, and most conversations and discords and EVEs and across the New Eden, a lot of those were items that were brought up. Um, kind of pointing towards holy crap how did you let this out of the how do you let this out of the station as a patch but um, they, they fixed it very quickly and uh, so good on them but yeah um, so, didn't, didn't really affect major gameplay items so uh, the pitching shall continue on the gameplay items for those people who are not happy with it or uh, and then being uh, counter argued by those who do like it i'm finding it is split 50 50 by the way there's really you either love it or hate it very common uh, and you've changes. So a little bit more uh, on that, just to make sure you knew what was going on in case you didn't. Again, we talked about the luxury yacht um, not being able to use both its main powers at the same time. So they fixed that by adding a high slot. The reason that became an issue is nullifier, uh, the nullification module was a low slot first. So when they said, okay, okay, we'll make it compete with your, the damage that you do and the utility that you have on a ship rather than its defenses, when we make that switch, that will make the choices different and it'll nerf your ability to do more offensive capability with uh, the nullification. So you're either trying to escape or trying to get by people or you do damage. And that's where the conflict is when you have to decide how to fit a ship. The problem is the luxury yacht only had one slot there and it was meant for your cloak. So you could cloak while you were flying. And uh, so they screwed that up and needed to fix that. That wasn't a problem originally. It was a problem because they fixed a different problem. The second thing is, uh, and Abby pointed this out yesterday, the restrained interdiction nullifier. This module here is a version of the, the line of modules. And that specific one, for some reason, didn't get something turned on and it did work on a bomber. And that's what they removed here. That's right. Right. And then the last thing was there was an error dialog box for when you, we don't have a picture of it, but when some, when you did something you couldn't do, it would give you a code based unreadable to humans uh, message that wasn't translated. So they basically translated the text. In other words, from computer code language to this is the alert you should say, here's the text. So all that is, is just cleanup work. So these are a lot of fixes. And then the shuttle had the power to be innately nullified. So if you get in a shuttle, you can fly anywhere without being slowed down by interdictories in, or by spheres or bubbles, we call them. Uh, you could do that. It just wasn't written in the description. Now it is. So there you go. Thanks, yep. Rendell. You're very welcome. All right, Abby. Uh, let's talk about... Oops, this is probably not what I want to show. Let's talk about the... Uh, Planetary interaction. Um, do you want to do an introduction to it? Do you have that? For... Pi, pi, pi. I love pi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do you want me to share my screen with you? Yeah, let's do that. Get out the ice cream, folks. This section it's of pie the pi time with vanilla ice cream. This section of the show, hilarious. Uh, that ice cream comment you made the other day. We won't get into that. <laughs> but, um, this section of the show is, uh, again, a talking in station's realization that the uh, economic changes that happened to production, to industry, these big industry updates that they did, were really an opportunity to become a more diverse harvester and uh, different harvesting uh, jobs were opening up. So it's really a giant jobs program for EVE players. And we talked about moon mining not that long ago and before that. Uh, we talked about gas mining. So now we're talking about planetary interaction, which is basically planet mining and how you can make some money doing that. And here we go. I'll watch the stream.
Go ahead, Abby. Perfect. So, um, planetary interaction is is basically the planting a what's called a command center on a planet. Um, it takes a lot of clicking, and then it is often what's called a passive ISK income, in the sense that once it's set up and flowing, you just uh, recycle your miners, and you can keep earning this these products in the background, reacting them into higher tiers. And eventually you will end up um, just earning money while while you sleep, right? So it's uh, considered passive income. I have some great um, websites here for just that, like, can break down the products and the steps. Um, we'll put these in the description notes of the video. Um, and actually put them in the, uh, in the Twitch show, right? Twitch right I can now. help with that. You talk. I got them for you. Cheers, bud. Um, so one of the things is uh, you will require a couple of skills for this. There is a handful of skills under the planet management section. Um, they all require a mega. So this is something that is completely off uh, off the limits for alpha accounts. Real quick, can you zoom in on the text there? I mean, uh, just blow it up. So yeah, it's yeah. bigger. That'll just make it more. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. No problem. So um, one of the skins you're going to want to... Uh, one of the skills you are going to want to get to scan a planet is called remote sensing. Um, and then planetology and remote sensing will allow you to scan a planet and will give you a better idea of where these resources are on these planets. So as you can see here, these hotspots on the, um, on the planet are where uh, resources are located. And so with better scanning skills, you can locate better hot pockets so you'll have essentially more income. Um, so once you have your two scanning skills, the only other skills would be command center upgrades, which allows you to upgrade the little command centers you put on the planet, and interplanetary consolidation. And this will allow you to have more planets. You can have uh, one natively, and then this skill gives you uh, up to five at level five. So, you, so each character can have a maximum of six planets. Well, the, the skill, there is, uh, the skill gives you plus one planet per level. Yes, yeah. And if you are Omega, you get one that you can use. So you can have up to six at level five. So there's uh, different types of planets. Barren, gas, ice, lava, oceanic, plasma, storm, and temperate. And these planets, um, different materials come from these planets. So on a, on a barren planet, you, you see here, you get like base metals, noble metals. Uh, on an ice planet, you would get gases. You know, oceanic planet would have more liquid based stuff. So different planets, um, different, what the first level is called like an ore zero. Um, and then you get a different, uh, so, so different materials from these different planets. And you combine them in different ways to form uh, higher tiered products. So let me just show this. This is a, a great website. It's Eve Web Tools, PI Tools. Over here on the left, we have uh, P0 or OR0. We turn it into P1. This is our P1 here. Uh, we, we, we refine and combine these into um, different combinations. So if we wanted to make coolant, which is used in like POS fuel and stuff, uh, we would need like to harvest aqueous liquids and iconic solutions from a planet. We would convert that into water and electrolytes, convert that into coolant. And then you can also see what that is used up later on. So up there, level four, or something like the, the wet, wetware mainframes would use a lot of P3s um, and then more P2s because as you go up in the levels, you combine more of the lower tiered items, uh, but their volume reduces. So uh, the lowest tier would be this aqueous liquids. It would take 3,000 aqueous liquids to make 20 water, but the, the volume of that will go down significantly. So really... Well, I think what you're doing should, is should reemphasize that it is smarter to uh, 
take the raw materials that you're mining out of the earths or the planets, convert them to products. And those products are smaller than the bulk stuff that you're mining out of there. So you want to do at least one conversion to products away from the raw materials. Yeah, there's different um, strategies, but okay, the least you want to do would be going from the P0 to a P1 before you export it off the planet. That's the bare minimum, just because, as you said, the volume. You're going to be hauling all day. And the whole point of PI, in my opinion, would be to have to do the least amount of work possible. I mean, there's people with 50 PI accounts who probably do nothing but haul stuff, um, just refine it in factories, and then export it again. But, I mean, that's probably all they do all day with massive amounts of hauling. Uh, I always like to look at PI as a nice, easy way to supplement your income. You know, if you live in a wormhole or if you live in NullSec, you can help make fuel blocks and sell them to your corp for cheap or like a corp mate that will make fuel blocks or items used in Tech2 production or like Nanite repair paste. Um, and particularly now with the introduction of PI into the ships themselves, there's going to be a seriously uh, higher increase in demand for these PI products. So you'll never f be short of a buyer for PI. So the question is, how much time and effort do you want to put in um, and how to get that return? And I, my, I've always found that like you can put in a small amount of, of effort. Maybe you're doing two or three hours work a week and you can earn, you know, depending on your setup and where you live, easily 100 to kind of 200, 300 million a month uh, per character. It all depends on where you're based, uh, how much research you do for the product you're picking, how the markets change. Um, ideally, PI is, is where you want to have some nice tools or you build yourself a nice custom spreadsheet if you really want yeah. to get into the deeps of PI. So I want to make a comment right here. Uh, this website, this tool here, uh, I don't know why my Google has not found it, but if you were a PI person and you were ever came across Eve Planets, Eve Planets is gone now for a couple of years, three years. This here has a system checker. Uh, I think it's uh, the second tab on the top where you, you know, there's a way to check that there, uh, one to the right. Um, and this is like Eve Planets. You can put your system in. It'll tell you what can be built in that system with the planets that are available. You can very quickly navigate next door. So that the, the goal is, if you have a lot of characters or even one, you want to find, you want to quickly go through an area of space that you're interested in doing PI in, and you want to pick your market item, your market spot, and then you could use a tool like this to quickly search through uh, the planets in a system and very quickly say, can I build the thing I want or the things I want? The Eve Planets was a great tool for that, and I wholly, super happy that you're showing this because this is a direct replacement for that, for those people who have been also wondering like me. So uh, fantastic tool. Yeah, this was actually um, built by inspiration of the person who uh, was inspired by Eve Planets when it died. One thing about this that's really nice is you can actually simulate your whole setup. So let's say we have here like a lava planet. This is your command center upgrade skills. That gives you various amounts of like power grid and CPU for putting more structures down. I would highly recommend level four at a minimum for anyone who wants to try and make decent money with this. Um, but if you follow something, if you have absolutely no idea about PI, um, this guide here, our very basic planetary introduction guide I found from All Out PI, it's fantastic. Or the Eve Uni guide itself, very good. Um, but we can go back here and you can actually plan building API center um, and upgrading it. You can test out your setups. You can put down an extractor here. Okay, so this is us extracting the, the or zero. We are going to convert it into the P1 using these basic factories. Okay, um, you would create a link linking these. This is just like it's done in the game, but this allows for those serious people who really want to theory craft a massive PI setup or theory craft what they can be doing. You can set this up and you can calculate how much per uh, hour or day or week of a certain item you will be pulling. Um, Adam for Eve has a lovely PI planner as well. 
So it has a PI section that has just straight profitability. What's nice about this is if you're doing a, a factory planet setup where you're not really harvesting a lot of resources, instead what you would do is try and buy cheap materials from the market, like a cheap P1 or a cheap P2, transport it in, re, uh, refine it in a factory to a P4, and then sell it back to the market. Um, this is actually a very handy tool, so this could save you having to build a custom spreadsheet to do all this. No, you, no, it's not like a fitting tool. You wouldn't be able to copy something and import it into the game. Oops, I was but, muted again. I just asked the question, import, can you import or export any of these plans? The answer is no. No. Um, it doesn't work like that, but it's just, if you set up a planet, uh, it's going to cost you money to set it up. So it could save you maybe 20 or 30 million oh, yeah. in testing. Um, and, you know, Obviously, you could also go to CC and test it out if you want, but uh, these are, mm. um, it's just great to just be able to mess around with it. And so you've at least some idea. Um, because when you're mining, you're looking for the best like uh, deposits of a certain mineral or whatever. I'll just put it in that way. And that's not always correct. A lot of times you run out of um, bandwidth or I guess it's power or CPU and you end up having to destroy a structure and rebuild it in a different way or with something else in mind, a little longer, you know, transit line road, we'll call it between where you're mining and, and the factory. And so you can just kind of do the scratch work here without building something, then destroying it, then building it, then destroying it again until you get it right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and this is another great forum post I found from MEF's Magical PI Setup. And this is for, it's great. It says uh, setups for the indeterminably lazy. <laughs> so he's got great, uh, this is, um, I don't know. I, I've been in some course before that have had like uh, great guides to like, you know, help their players make their money. But these are just the various setups you can do. So as you can see here, he's got all his little items closer together. You want to have... Uh, you know, your launch pad or your storage pad all close together. That's going to save you power grid and CPU for, for being able to put down more extraction heads. Um, so for this, he's just literally harvesting, or this is a factory plan that you can see. He's going to be exporting and importing using these launch, pa launch pads and then just reacting as much as possible. So there's no actual uh, extracting of resources going on here. So in this kind of setup, you would be res you'd be extracting as much as possible on your really good planets and then maybe using a spare barren planet to do all your factory work. Um, I mean, Rundle, I know you've had some serious PI setups at, at times. Yep. I have, I have 14, 15 characters that, uh, that can do it. Um, I tend to, I, I've only ever done this type of thing once, um, because I tend to go T1 to about T3, some T4s, and then I let other people do this. Um, just for for multiple reasons, uh, primarily being the the taxation, uh, hauling, and time. Right? I I am I like to set eight days. Uh, I figure I can get to it by the weekend. That means I play. You know, uh, Saturday Sunday. I will get around to my PI. If I miss it, I got an extra day, so it doesn't stop. I can usually stop it. Uh, you know, restart it within six days. I take a little bit of the efficiency hit. But chains like this, where you have a large pile of just um, T3, T4 reactions like the, that you were showing, that takes a lot of extra work almost daily or every other day to put enough resources in to run all those factories to be efficient. Because it is a downward slide in terms of volume, a, ch a chain like that has a lot of upfront volume needed, which means lots of material, which means it goes quickly and you have to import it onto the planet on a fairly regular basis to keep the efficiency of that PI chain. So I, I have a slightly different model for mine on how I, how I do it. Uh, I tend to work out, uh, mine is somewhere in around 50 million a character uh, ish per week um, is what I tend to. That's how much you get do. out. Yeah, that's about in. what I get out. Okay. Yeah. 
So for 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 mine, when I was running it in uh, in Nullsec, the last time I was doing it, it was somewhere in the order of two billion a month is what I was doing passive, and I could probably really increase that if I wanted to play more. Like I'm saying, if I wanted to do this on a more frequent day-to-day basis, that could very quickly climb um, so that uh, because I'd be producing much larger, much more expensive on the market items, uh, but it fit my game plan. Maybe the next time I do it, I will you know, invest in some additional T3, T4 combines and try to push the limit a little bit. Who knows? I, I think I'm rolling a couple new characters right now. I might give that a try. <laughs> Uh, with six with six planets on each character, it's a lot of flying around, right? Um, so you get yeah, you well, get a little bored at about the tenth character when you well, have to this, go through your sixtieth planet. This is about to change a lot because uh, warp core stabilizers are now nerfed, and uh, that used to be a real yeah. a real free pass for a hauler to put four of those on there and to work in low sec. Uh, it was almost guaranteed you weren't going to get interfered with or caught. Uh, and you can just basically go and get your PI. And low sec produces better than high sec, so you're making more money that way with a, a great deal of safety. That is about to change uh, considerably. Absolutely, for sure. Uh, it's a consideration. Um, and, and I think that's where you're going to want tighter control over the number of planets. You're going to want to try to maximize. You know, you can over farm a planet for a resource if you and five other corp mates I'll drop a character, uh, you know, I'll drop a planet on there and then, you know, 10 other friends show up as well. You can, you can over those hot spots or those areas that you um, like to mine will slowly dissipate. That's one of the mechanics, right? Yeah. It's um, kind of, it's kind of like an asteroid belt in the sense that you can overmine it and it'll diminish and then you leave it alone and it'll slowly regenerate back over time yes. again. Is that actually... One trick. Sorry, yes, wait, that does but, happen. Before you go into advanced play, do... Did that trick actually, does that really happen? Absolutely, yes. it does. So you can overmine a certain area. The deposit will evaporate and you'll have to yeah. move. So if you look at the planetary interaction map, right, let's okay. say um, let's say on a scan area at the, uh, I don't know, it doesn't matter where, at the pole, one of the poles, there's this massive deposit that even when you reduce the scan levels down, you it's still this big hot spot of resources. If you and five other people put your your uh, your mind, because I don't get to see what the other guy's doing, so I place mine on one edge and I put all you know eight heads right in the right on the hot spot, and someone else comes and does it and does the same thing. His heads are over top of mine, and so on and so forth. There's no interaction penalty for if I'm doing it versus Abby's doing it. I only have interaction penalties if the resource heads are touching of my own. Um, of my own system. So I optimize that. Abby optimizes it. So does you. So does Arcia. And now there's four of us. Nick does it, a bunch of other people. And now there's like 10 people sucking resources out of the one hotspot. It will diminish over time. And that hotspot, if you scan it again in, in a couple of weeks, will be significantly smaller. And you'll be like, where's so, the money? So even among other players, you, I didn't realize that was happening. I know that was the design of it. But I never, in my experiences, never ran into a situation where that was happening. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I wasn't it, sure if it, it's, if it was. No, it does. It, yeah, it does. It's not slowly, as Nick is saying, right? And that's another reason why I do the eight days, right? I just, I just kind of average. I'm looking at, for me, PI is about averaging. For me, PI isn't a min-max gameplay style. It's an averaging over time gameplay style. Um, and so that's that seven days helps too, but yeah, it, it is happening. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have become a average overtime player with PI once. Um, I did a crazy PI setup in a wormhole. Um, we had a high sec static, so logistics was very easy. The nice thing about wormholes is they count as null sec, so they have large amounts of materials in the in the moons or in the planets sorry um but we were buying and selling um from jita and you know rolling our hole to getting a static close to jita shipping everything in using our our planets to make up the loss we had and then exporting it out it is an incredible amount of work um that's kind of what you end up doing every other day for a few hours and you can make a lot of money but it's not fun so 
my philosophy has become making simple things I know will sell well. Fuel mm-hmm. blocks, nanite repair paste. You know, there's a handful of items that are like your 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 standard go to items uh, for a long time. Now that has had a bit of a shake up with the change in the industry. Yeah. So I, I, everything actually is more valuable now than it was kind of before. Um, yeah, I'm a little excited. I'm excited to see what what I can do with 15 characters. To yeah, use. I'm definitely looking at putting up uh, some more PI again and. You know, as well, the the null sec and the wormhole planet resources, they're the best. Low sec is a step below that. And then high sec is where you'd have the worst. So if you're in high sec, it might be worth just jumping into a, a quiet low sec system nearby, putting some putting some resources on some moons or on some planets, extracting the resources, and you, you could double your income. Um if you if you want to get blown up in your epithal every now and again, you'll you'll probably come out ahead and in, in profit. And you'll be making content for other people. So in my experience, and this may have changed because I did this when it came out for a while and uh, haven't done it recently, but it seemed like the low sec under 0.3 was more profitable than, sorry, under two and two and one basically were better than three, four and five up to high sec or whatever. So. So the deeper you go into low sec, the richer the planets. And I did not see a big difference, not a huge difference between a 0.1 and zero zero systems, which are null sec. So you it's, can save yourself like, the headache. Yeah, it's as you go down the, the security status, the regen rate and the size and the depth of the of the resource pool is larger. So this whole degradation doesn't happen the same in a in a in a point one as it does in a point five or as it does in a in a point nine for example and same in null sec i don't know if they use the true sec status in null sec or they use cap it true sec by the way is there's actually a, all the way to a negative one standing and further for systems in null sec uh, some of the old maps have the actual true sec value in case anyone's wondering um the other the other thing i want to say about this is um you know there was some questions like how do you know who's using the planets well you can you can see the con- other players control centers you can't see their network so you can take the time sometimes it's a little hard to see the way the graphic is but you count the number of control centers and then you assume all right they must all be mining that super hot spot uh, one of my strategies is i don't go for the hot spot all the time um, especially if I, I see more than if i can find more than two or three other people, I assume they're there, and I, I try to move around and again the average the game play out. Um, now there's lots of little lots of little tricks um, for sure. Uh, other thing too, if you're thinking about doing this in high sec, uh, the taxes uh, are are rather high in high sec, and there's additional taxes that are uh, there's a skill that you can train to help reduce the additional high sec taxes even if it is a player corporation so look up that skill i think there's really like two player organizations that actually run the monopolies of all the high sec uh um customs offices but you have to run that i I would also say if you're in high sec and you're interested in trying don't get too worried about oh my god i'm going to have i'm not going to maximize my money if you do it even follow these guides you will make some money you might not make the maximum amount or the most optimal amount but you will make some money focus on um the t maybe just going to like the t2 stuff uh, or even just getting the raw materials and doing the first step of processing things like proteins water oxygen uh, those things are really going well right now there's there's need in from these industry changes these very low level ones are currently uh increasing in value the simplest of things so start simple get your feet wet understand how the mechanics work uh, understand how you're going to service your planets on a three days seven days whatever cycle that you can manage with your gameplay Mm -hmm. how are you going to haul the stuff you know the farther you you go away from the things you now have a logistics issue find a local buyer, talk up some other players. Hey, I'm going to do this. Do you, would you buy my stuff? All of those things that we've talked about on, on talking in stations about how to do marketing all play into PI as well. When you get to the marketing side of what do I do with the stuff I just got off the planet? All right, quick question. We have more from Abby, but quick question for Rundle or Abby. Uh, can you guys please show how to decide which planet in a system is more profitable for PI? That's a question from the Q guy. 
kind of a tough question. Yeah, so, well, yeah, um, it is a little bit of a tough question. Let me just get in the system and uh, on another screen and sort something out real quick. Um, I like to do taking things to like P P one P two. Uh, as Rundle said, um, I set my cycles to harvest my extractors for once a week, and then I haul things once a month, generally. And when you're going down to this P1 or P2 level, you're reducing it by enough volume, and you're adding enough value that it's like, just, it's passive income. You know, it's, if you're making 20, 30 million uh, per planet per week, that can really add up, and all, all of a sudden, you know, at the end of the month, you have a free battle cruiser. You can go and do PvP and without even without even put any effort into. It. So let me try and walk. Maybe Abby, you can try to to click along here. So if you go to the Adam for Eve, for example, and you go to there's yep. a planetary interaction profitability make under it, PI. Zoom in and make it bigger. Please. Yeah, if you go into the PI uh, drop down menu, there's a profitability. So if you go there. Yeah, that one there. And now you got some columns you can sort on profit or profit percentage or profit IPH. Any of those will do straight up profit. Um, you can pick a system. I, I pick Cheetah usually to watch, right? These are the these are the defaults. And uh, so there's the, the profit IPH is the profit divided by production time. So it's ISK per hour. That's what IPH stands for. So if you look at the is per hour, um, what you'll find is all the P4s are where the most is per hour are. And those are very difficult to do, which is why I say don't do that. Go to the P, you know, I, I say like the P percentage. And, and so the profit percentage is, I'm clicking at home too so I can. Um, and you'll see that things like what I said, those P1s, the proteins, the water, the bacteria, the oxygen, those things are easy and quick to pull off. And they will sell well. They have a very reasonable um, you know, profit number. Well, as an example there, your, your proteins, your P1 is more profit, uh, more IPH than uh, the P4 recursive computing. That was the, right. So you're better off just taking all this P1 off a planet, selling it in the market, than you are going through all the F extra effort to get to a P4 in this case. And this stuff changes all the time. You know, this could change uh, by month. Um, so you could just move quickly with the market. You know, one one month you're extracting guidance systems or the next month you're building this. Um, yep. So that's step one. Try and see what you got on the market. So he's asking, how do you make the most hits, right? So there's one then you, I would pick two or three of those. And then I would go to a planet. Uh, I would try to figure out what can I build. And this is where the, the PI this tools guy. on the web tools. Yep, this is where this comes into play. So I would like to try to pick a planet that I can produce two or three things on so that if I want to change my, like Abby was saying, if I want to change and react to the market kind of quickly, I don't have to, totally remove everything off the planet and start again. I just change what I'm extracting and I change the recipes and it's a smaller cost to resubmit that in your, um, to make those changes on a planet. If you have to redrop a whole new command center and rebuild the, the whole thing, you're going to ultimately lose ISK. But, um, you know, that's a good, that is another good solid way to be able to react and say, I'm going to do proteins up to a while, and now I'm going to go over and do oxygen, and then I'm going to come back and do proteins, and you can go back and forth, or yeah. you just train up the skill and do four or five planets in a system. Right, I'm, That's I'm, the other way. I'm going to make it easier. This is how it yep. used to be, and you guys can tell me if I'm wrong, but I would find a lava planet, a barren planet. Those are your two most profitable. If you get a plasma, it's like a wild card in a deck of cards, right? It does a lot of different things, um, but what you want to build towards is robotics, and uh, generally you want all the pieces to go into robotics. So like an enriched uranium, I think is one, mechanical parts, build those two things and yes. robotics, and that's it. Don't do anything else, start there, build that, always profitable, always in high demand, and easy because barons and lavas are everywhere. So uh, th that's how you wanna start, get your feet um, on the process, and then go into exotics. Now here's the difference. Recently, there's been a change that 
is requiring a lot more stuff that used to be just byproducts like water. And so that may start to become profitable. So keep your eye out on that, but start with those basic ones, uh, enriched uranium and um, mechanical parts. And I think coolant's needed for fuels, but other than that... Yeah, PI fuel blocks. Yeah, PI fuel blocks. Other than that, it's, it used to be used a lot for uh, for pause towers before they actually even made fuel blocks. Yeah, but construction blocks is another one that's not. Yeah, too construction bad. blocks. Yeah, those are you know those are the building blocks of things. So try with those. That's what I would do early on. And here's the other thing: the way this was designed when it first came out was kind of a mini game. Uh, it came out with Tyrannus uh, expansion, and you were basically it was really interesting because the more that you played actively, like if you sat there and did the things. Um, you actually could say, I want the cycle to be really fast, like minutes. Uh, or I could, you could say, I'm going to take a break. So I want this cycle to take three days. So I'm going to back off. If it took three days, you eventually mined a lot, but it took a long time to do it. But if you sat there and did active gameplay on it, you could extract a lot of wealth quicker. And that was the basic setup of it. I don't think they've done anything like that since that I can, as far as mechanics go. So they were experimenting with that, like play active, make more money, play passive, make less money. And uh, what people have decided over time is what works for them. And a lot of people were like, I'm going to do the lazy man approach, which means I'm going to set something up for three days. So I only check it every three days. It doesn't take much of my game time. It's not as much money, but it is, you know, a constant income. And when you do that sort of thing, you're not looking for the heavy deposits. You're not looking to extract a bunch of this because you will never match its counterpart a bunch of that at the same rate. So your factory or your deposit area will fill up with one way more than the other and you're totally out of balance. So you need, either need to buy some at the market and put it in so that it gets back into balance or you need to slow one down and, and uh, to the level of the slow one. That's the lazy man approach. It's basically to find a balance between two things so that it creates the object that they're both needed for at the, a steady pace without overfilling on either ingredient. Uh, and, and that takes a whole nother show to kind of explain, but there's different philosophies. Do it fast, do it slow, uh, up to you. But if you're going to do it, go robotics, go enrich uraniums, construction parts, uh, and mechanical uh, parts. Yeah, that's the T3 route, right? So that's a whole nother set of chains. Those, are, those you have to have the advanced factories. So if you're starting out, sure, go that direction eventually. Um, you will, you can do um, those core items. You can do the mechanical. Uh, you can do the rich uranium. You can do all those combines on one planet um, and extract those off. And then you'll have to take all those parts and move them over to do... Um, uh, you can P3. do robotics, yeah, to do the P3, right? Yeah, generally you can get up to P2, extract that off a single planet, yeah. and then if you want to take it further with a, a factory planet, you can do P3. But I really do believe that the, the once you get it set up, which is a bit of effort, you know, do your research, have a look, set up your planet, then do the least amount possible. You want it to be as hands-off as possible. Cycle once a week. Fact, a sell it once a month you know just passive income it's a great side passive income all right abby sorry i interrupted there but just uh, no it was great 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 input thank you whatever last yeah. uh, pieces of the puzzle you have there i saw some images oh yeah just a uh, very last i just threw uh, some fits together that might be helpful if you are moving through some dangerous space um particularly for those who might want to venture out into low sec or a wormhole and try and get some PI. So these are just some epithals. That's the uh, the Galente one that gets the bonus to the PI hauling bay. Um, so with the changes, I mean, that's kind of a basic standard fit. I'd use a workhorse stabilizer, something to make you align quicker. And just at this point, you want to be moving as quick as possible. If you do happen to get caught, Try some energy, uh, newts or nas, and the burst jammer might be able to save you. Um, this is just the second one with the interdiction nullifier module. Again, might be very useful now that these these ships can fit these. Absolutely. Um, for the more wormhole or or null sex space. Um, and then lastly, you can always throw a cloak on it. Uh, with a cloak and a micro warp drive, you could be able to move quicker through the gates. This has got like a the low friction nozzle joint, so you move a bit quicker, but still one high hyperspatial for for warping fast. So if anyone's just a a bit curious as to what you might use to get around 
a low sec or a wormhole or an old sec you haven't been before if you're just dipping in uh, something like this would be a good starting point yeah That's and right. if you're looking for help uh join the uh discord we have an industry channel lots of good people there to help you get you set up and started on your on your pi um and i'll put all these links to these websites in the in the show notes for the video yeah final word on that from my side there's there's lots of absolutely mathematically correct ways but don't let that bother you play the way that's going to fit you go to t3 there are some planets that you can do all the way to t3 if you pick the right planet sometimes you don't need to do that but start small get get the understanding you're going to burn a few planets you're going to oh that didn't work there's lots of reading don't get overwhelmed you can make some really nice passive income in the game um and uh yeah, come on into the Discord and, and ask questions. Thanks. Lots of advice out there. So uh, mini, it's a mini game. It's unlike uh, anything else in EVE Online. It's its own type of mini game, always was. This came in at the same time, more or less, that Dust 514 came in, where there were mercenaries actually fighting in an FPS game. It's a first-person shooter game uh, on certain planets. And what was supposed to happen is the people that were playing the FPS game were supposed to, you know, the console game on PS3, were supposed to fight over planets and that would somehow affect how well those planets were harvested and none of that gameplay ever made <laughs> like it just that all fell apart so what we have is a lingering interesting concept that is really just a mini game standalone there's really not anything like it um, it does follow one thing and that is that you take one ingredient second ingredient put it together and you make a new ingredient and you take that ingredient and another one that's made out of two other ingredients. You put those together and you make another ingredient and you keep building that pyramid up to like four levels. And then at the end, you have a product that's huge and it's taken all kinds of different ingredients to put it together. And that's what goes into structures. That's what goes into, I think now probably some capital ships. So yeah, the uh, demand pool is going to be big. Yeah. Yep. Uh, the, uh, the um, planetary, uh, the POCOs, right? The planetary, um, offices that are used to get the PI off are actually made with the PI. You need a bunch of those, including the gantry. There's a bunch of things that the PI and some of these higher elements are used for. Yeah. All right. Anything else, Abby? No, I think that's it. I'm going to answer a curious question of my own. This came in with Tyrannus. I am sure of it. One of my 2010. Favorite, one of my favorite videos. Thank you. <laughs> that's what I was looking for. I was like, wait, that come in 2010? Okay, I'm going to double check just to make sure. Uh, Tyrannus, yes. It was It was actually 11 years ago in May 26th. So right about 11 years ago, that's when this came in. It's been around since. Uh, one this last is, um, Yeah. Sorry, this is a, an, another great PI website as well. It's, it's like the last one, but uh, it's a little bit more stylized looking. Same layout, uh, hands.io PI. Mm -hmm. Some people mentioned in the Twitch as well. Yeah, there was one where you could pick a planet and it told you all the things you could create out of that planet. Oh, you can do that with the the one I have. Okay. If you that go was down what here. I was saying. Yeah, so, yeah. If you go down here, e planets thing, right? And so you go down there and I see it lights them all up. Okay. It lights them all yes, up, right? So yeah. if you go to the if you go to the oh, the storm one, for example, you're talking about robot, right? And if you go to the um, yeah, you go to the storm. Or is it the plasma? There's, you go to plasma. Well, plasma does uh, all the good stuff. Robotics will be on plasma. That's the only yeah, planet so you can you, build you robotics. Yeah. yeah, you can do plasma. If you find a plasma planet, you can go straight to robotics with one chain or, or like with one planet um, yeah. set up where you can extract both, do all the combines and have robotics literally sitting there and extract. Those are nice to do. If you are going to do T3, look for those. Look for those ones where you can do the full P3 uh, you know, level three right on one planet. It avoids a lot of hassle. Your turnover per hour, again, this is the averaging philosophy, not the maximizing philosophy. Your life will be a whole lot easier. You fly around, you pick up the robotics and you scoot off. You yeah. fly around, you pick up the the next thing that you're doing, whatever, um, transcranial microcontrollers, blah, blah, blah. You know, whatever. Yeah, but the problem with this setup is plasmas are rare and therefore they're in higher demand and other people exactly. have the same idea. So you're not going to get that. What I would do is look for lava and barren planet systems that and have a bunch import. of those. Yeah. Yes. And use one yes. planet as just a factory where you assemble everything yep. that you're harvesting everywhere else. That's, I think, your best bet. It's only one trip in to pick things up. No, that's not true. To move things around and then to pick things up. It's not too bad. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Abby Rundle, for walking us through that stuff.
we have to go. I think that's the end. Arcia, before we go, thanks for sticking with us. Do you do any PI? I've set it up. Forgot about it for like five years. That's what I thought. <laughs> you might want to go pick that up. It's, it's probably still sitting yeah, there on the planet for you. You have a lot of money. Uh, yeah, your factories yes. are turned off by now. <laughs> yeah, it's whatever. Yeah. All I have right. some in like low sector, like in like some in syndicate. There's some, there's some role play, can... role play uh, opportunities here, right? Like you're some yeah. kind of voice viceroy, and you're coming to inspect the, uh, you know, the factory. That's, and... that's not what's happening. I'm you a can... lazy, I'm a lazy independent <laughs> capsuleer. You can remotely who hired a bunch those... of people and forgot. You can remotely destroy those things like a like a giant despot from somewhere else in the universe. You can just press a button and kaboom, the whole planet. The, yeah. the whole factory is gone. Rundle, you I can... just have to figure out which character I made them on. You can come in and play manager uh, <laughs> to these fictional <laughs> characters. If you're not, if you don't get enough of that in your real life, you get to play manager yeah, of crap. factories. I'll bring ice cream. <laughs> Ooh, Imagine flavor. like waking up for the morning and being like, yeah, uh, our boss exploded the planet from 400 light years away. <laughs> exploded the, the factory from the factory, 400 yeah. light years away. Yeah, man. Oh, guess I'm unemployed. <laughs> that made it. All right. New. Thanks, Arcia. Thanks, uh, Abby. And thank you, Rundle. And thank you guys for watching Talking In Stations today. We will send you off to another show and see you tomorrow on Talking In Stations.